Hey everyone, I'm Rob Westervelt. I am a strategy and innovation professional, and in this video, I'm going to help us develop the mindset we need as we approach our research projects. Um, so with that, let's jump right in. So we're gonna talk about innovation, and innovation is really uh, about gaining an insight. So I wanna tell you a quick story about this woman, Kate Zufel, and if you don't know who Kate is, you're going to be shocked when you find out what she's done. And the reason I love this story is because it leads to um, the idea that innovation isn't for other people. It's for everyone. And so what Kate had in terms of an insight is in the 50s, she was reading through the newspaper and noticed that people were making clay figures out of this product called Cutoff. Now, cut all was a wallpaper putty that was used to clean wallpaper back in the day when wallpaper was actually made out of paper. So if you can imagine, it's hard to clean a wall if it's made out of paper because it will tear when it gets wet. Now, one of the reasons this product existed is at that time, most homes were heated with two, uh, one of two types of fuel, wood or coal. And that would leave soot on the walls and so you needed to cut all to clean that soot off the wall. But she had an insight, and that insight was this. She was not an MBA, not a PhD, not a CEO or a leading business thinker. She was an assistant preschool teacher. Now, she had a brother-in-law who basically ran this company, owned this company. And as you can imagine, an innovation happened where homes started getting uh, heated by alternative fuels, uh, namely elect electric uh, heaters and also natural gas heaters. So as you can imagine, the um, charts on Cutall, they just took a nosedive. But Kate was thinking, wait a second, I see these people using this modeling uh, putty to make figurines and I know something about this modeling putty. It's essentially like dough. I mean, it's, it's non-toxic. And I'm going to take some of this. I'm going to add some food dye to it. And I'm going to give it to my preschool students. And what ends up coming out of this is Play-Doh. So when we think about innovation, this is a definition that uh, uh, this formula actually comes from Bob Sutton at Stanford University who defines innovation as creativity plus implementation. But it all begins with this insight. And her insight was non-toxic, clean, and colorful. Back in the day, uh, most modeling uh, clay was highly toxic. And so they couldn't let kids play with it because if they swallowed it, they would get really sick or die. Now, they... Uh, the one of the insights from this is that you don't have to create something new for it to be an innovation. So she took something that existed, namely the cut all wallpaper putty. She took another thing that existed, which was food dye. She combined them together and then she gave them to a different group of people, namely these preschool kids. So that is innovation. If I and every time I give this presentation and I'm in a big room, I was I once gave this presentation to a room of over 400 people. I asked them to raise their hands if they play with Play-Doh and a hundred percent of people raise their hands. So that is an example of innovation. So why do design thinking? You, you are going to hear more and more about design thinking in your coursework. Uh, so why design thinking? Well, it's very applicable to what you're doing, number one. Uh, but essentially, design thinking is a disciplined process of discovering an insight, just like Kate did, designing a solution for a specific end user. Again, Kate was a perfect example and successfully delivering it. Now, what you may not know about Kate and her team, originally her brother-in-law who owned Cutall and some others, when they got together, they, they originally uh, were calling it Rainbow Modeling Clay. But she thought, you know, that's not very accessible for kids. Uh, it's essentially dough that you can play with, so let's just call it Play-Doh. And then they took it to a show called Captain Kangaroo, and they just gave it to the kids to play with, and then there was uh, a national phenomenon was born. But the key here is that it was implemented, and that's what we mean by successfully delivering it. 
So let's jump into this. What is the design thinking process? You might be familiar with this. It begins with empathy. And so you want to learn about the audience for whom you are designing through observation and interviews. So you want to know who is my user and what matters to this person. Then you want to define the problem. This is a step that's often skipped. We're going to go into how to avoid the pitfalls in the design or in the define phase. But this is where you really want to create a point of view that is based on user needs and insights. And this really gets to this idea of what are their needs? What are what what is this problem that we're defining? And then we want to ideate. And boy, people do not know how to ideate. And that's where we brainstorm. And we're going to talk about what is actually brainstorming. And you want to come up with as many creative solutions as possible, not just one. Uh, and you really want to focus on what are the wild ideas, because it's really these wild ideas that become the great innovations. And then we need to prototype. And that is we build a representation of one or more of our ideas to show to others. And this is really about answering that question. How can I show my idea to others so I can get feedback? Now, a prototype is designed with the idea that we don't know what the answers are. OK, we're trying to probe and discover. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And then we want to test it. We want to share your prototyped idea with your original user for feedback. What worked, what didn't work. And then, of course, we want to implement it. And that is to take that idea to market, monitor it and uh, see what the feedback is and really answer that question. How is it working out? OK, so that's a general overview of the design thinking process. I know you're going to probably go through this in more detail, but it's always helpful before we begin. So we always want to start with empathy. OK, empathy is key, and that really means crawling into the skin of the people for whom we are trying to help. OK, so this is a classic design thinking problem. So when I studied design thinking at Stanford University, this is the first thing that they showed us. And they asked this question, what does he need? Now, as you can imagine, and every time I show this, it's always the same answers pop up. Oh, he needs a stool or a ladder or he needs longer arms or he needs his mother or he needs, you know, um, some sort of gadget. He needs shoes. He needs, you know, you can come up with all kinds of really creative answers. And sometimes they, they're astonishingly good. Um, but here's the problem. We have absolutely no idea what this little boy needs. It could be the case that he said, I just had a goal of climbing up and being able to touch this book and I've accomplished my goal and now I'm done. And then as he gets down, we have all these solutions that we've given him. And he's like, what, what is all this? And this really speaks to a problem that often occurs when we do innovation is we just assume that we know what the answer is. And innovation is not for knowing the answer. If you already know the answer, then you just need to implement that uh, answer. Innovation is the idea we don't know, so we have to try. But it starts with empathy. And therefore, we have to start without judgment. We cannot make a judgment on what this, what this little boy needs. We have to come with a beginner's eye. And when we come with a beginner's eye, we are a tabula rasa, and that creates curiosity. So curiosity is critical for innovation. And then we have to approach it optimistically. We can't say, oh, this kid's never going to get it. You know, he doesn't know what he's doing. Uh, and then we want to be respectful because we want to work with the people we're trying to help. And the only way to do that is be respectful of them and be curious and say, well, why are you doing what you're, what, what you're doing? There may be good reasons behind this. And we have to understand what those are. So I love this quote from Tim Brown at IDEO. Empathy is really about seeing the world through the eyes of others understand the world through their experiences and feel the world through their emotions. So this will become key in a second here. So how do we empathize with the end user? I love this cartoon by Tom Fishburne. He's got a lot of really funny ones, but he says if here's, here's this uh, group of guys trying to design like a doll or something for little girls. If I were our teenage girl target, I would love our new product. Have you actually talked to any to make sure what and leave this room? This is <laughs> super funny, but this actually happens more often than we think. So when we empathize with end users, we've got to get outside. OK, immerse ourselves in their environment. We talk about 
making a mini documentary. That's one way to think about this. And you immerse yourself in the environment. You observe them in the wild, so to speak. Tell a story about who this person is. Describe their environment, their situation, and what they're doing in it, okay? So this is really critical. So let, let's say maybe you're at a church or you're in a ministry. You want to observe the people you're trying to help to figure out why they're doing what they're doing and what is their dilemma. And then you want to engage them after you observe and ask them questions, interview them, find out what their what is their background that led to them making the choices that they made or discover who is the supporting cast. They have family members. Do they have friends that are involved in uh, what's going on? And then we want to define the problem. Now, this is where everything usually goes wrong. Okay, here's a funny example of this from Delbert. Starting next week, our, our meetings will be stand-ups with no chairs, so we'll be more focused. Okay, so the problem is we need to get more focused. So you examined all the problems in the company and decided the root cause was chairs. Well, we're also going to loosen the dress code. So our, problem, our, our problems are chairs and pants. So this is really funny, but this is often what happens when we go to define the problem. We just assume what the problem is. Now, I love this quote from Einstein where he says, if I was given one hour to save the world, I would spend 59 minutes defining the problem and one minute solving it. We tend to want to do the opposite. We tend to want to jump to solutions and then, uh, you know, kind of give a description of the problem that fits the solution that we prefer. This is not correct, okay? What's, what's critical in innovation is that we spend a lot more time understanding what the problem actually is that we're trying to solve for. Now, there is a pitfall to this, and I'm going to share with you uh, Bernie Roth, who is the founding dean of the Stanford Design School, uh, where design thinking really took root. And he has what he calls Roth's number one rule for problem solving. And he had given this uh, lecture on um, design thinking and innovation. And this woman came up to him and she said, look, Bernie, help me out here. How do I find a spouse? I've tried everything, but I haven't been able to find a spouse. Now, what Roth, Roth's uh, number one rule is, is don't ask a question in the form of an answer. And as you can see, the answer is, how do I find a spouse? Okay. It is in the form of a question, but it's an answer. She's already figured out, this is what I need. And, and he asked the question, what would that do for you if you were able to find a spouse? Okay, what would that do for you? So think about that for yourselves. If you've come to the answer, then ask yourself, what would that do for you? Um, same with your, um, with your, the people for whom you're trying to innovate for. If their answer is, well, here's what I need, then ask them that question. If you got this thing, what would that do for you? And she answered the question. She says, well, if I had a spouse, I would have companionship. He goes, oh, okay. So the real question is, how might I find companionship? He goes, well, you've got one answer, which is get a spouse, but there's a lot of other answers that we could explore. And this is where we really get into the concept of ideation, but you can meet friends online, you could take classes, you could join a church, you could get a pet, you could join a club. Hey, you could do all of these things and find companionship. He was asked also from a, a lady one time, how do I get my husband to stop snoring? And it was the same sort of idea. Well, you could divorce your husband, you could, because really what she wanted was a good night's sleep. And so he reframed the question to, uh, how can I get a good night's sleep? And he's like, well, you could divorce your husband. You could um, sleep in a different room. You get earplugs so you could get the idea of what we're talking about. Okay, so we got to reframe the problem. And one of the ways to do that is to create a point of view. And so here's an example of a point of view that I had to create for um, a project where I was trying to improve the in and out uh, experience at a hotel. Um, and this one was in wine country, so this was back when I lived in uh, outside of Portland. So um, what, what this is is a point of view map, and basically you can kind of see what, how this actually works itself out. So I observed the folks that were there, 
and I could see what did they say, what did they do, and uh, of course I create this map and I start putting down my notes in these uh, categories, and then you have to infer from your observations. So what did they think? How did they feel, right, as you're interviewing them? Um, and then you create this point of view. So in this case, this was a, um, oh, I don't remember the name of the hotel chain, but what was unique about this hotel was that it attracted a lot of uh, wine tasting visitors who needed to save time and money. So they weren't staying at a, at a b and &B. But the insight was, is for them, the hotel was like a B&B &B and, and breakfast was super important. And so as the hotel started to reframe, well, wait a second, maybe we need to act more like a B&B. &B. So then they start ramping up their breakfasts. They start giving um, recommendations for wineries. They start creating transportation options for uh, the hotel and the like. So this is an example of framing the problem and creating a point of view. Then once we have that point of view, we want to ideate. Okay. And I want to introduce you, if you don't know who this gentleman is, Alex Osborne. He is the one who actually coined the term brainstorm. And what he said was critical is that you create a judgment-free environment. And when you do, you'll unleash a torrent of creativity. And that is key, is creativity. And you want to think about the setup when you do uh, ideation. Okay. And this idea that joy is the jet fuel. So you don't want to just come out of a meeting from, you know, doing your emails or being in a meeting to jumping into ideation. You got to break free and get into a creative mindset. You want to recruit creative people. You don't want Eeyores in there who are negative people. Get some food and some toys. You want lots of paper markers or um, whiteboards and you want space to break up into groups so you can have small groups of people coming up with ideas and having fun. You want to warm up, get your body and your mind together, and you want to read the rules. So this is just the setup for ideation, okay? But then here's the rules for brainstorming. This comes from Osborne, and actually this has been developed over time. <clears throat> I'm going to give you the example that they give at Stanford. So key, deferred judgment. We talked about that at the very beginning. Encourage wild ideas. I'm really going to jump into this for you because this is super important. Build on the ideas of others. We don't just want a bunch of ideas. We want to take ideas and then we want to ramp up those ideas and add to them. We want to go for volume, not quality. Don't say things like, well, that's not very practical or that won't work. And then you want to have one conversation at a time, okay? Because this idea of building on others cannot happen if you have multiple conversations going on and people are getting scattered all over the place. And then you want to share headlines. You want to reduce it down to a headline. Now, if you are designing with a group and let's say you have a uh, high powered leader in the organization, you want to watch out for that person. That's what's called the hippo, the highest paid person in the room, because they're going to tend toward, uh, uh, things can gravitate toward their perspective. So you got to be super, super careful and don't use things. If you are the leader, like, you know, I really like this idea. What do you guys think that can bias the group? So let me tell you about this light bulb story. Cause this gets to the idea of wild ideas. So there was this light bulb company that was really struggling, um, with their costs of their packaging and they, came up with an idea to say, hey, you know what, let's reduce the material costs by using newspapers. Um, and so they started getting recycled newspaper and putting it together and packing these light bulbs in there and they noticed something terrible happening. So think about this. Oh, I know what the answer to the problem is. Just get cheaper material. So they put this newspaper in and production almost grinds to a halt and you can imagine why. People are now reading the funny pages and reading the sports pages and reading stories and headlines, not packing um, light bulbs. So they decided, okay, we're going to do real ideation, get in a room. They got warmed up. They started getting into their wild and crazy ideas. And as they're joking around, one guy said, you know what we should do? We should like poke their eyeballs out so they can't see. And, you know, people kind of chuckled and laughed and, and this one guy said, hey, that's a great idea. You know what we could do? Let's hire blind people. Because blind people have, are really 
good uh, ta with tactile function in their hands and they don't read newspapers, they read Braille. And it turns out that there was a real demand uh, for blind uh, people who needed employment. And so they tried it out and guess what? It shot way up because they could use the newspaper and, um, and these, uh, these blind people were great employees. They, they were good with their hands. There was not as many light bulbs being broken. And then something unexpected happened. They got more business because people wanted to work with them because they were employing blind people. So here's an example of a wild idea leading to an insight that they didn't foresee that helped the company. Then we got to move to prototype. And remember, a prototype is not a final product. This is where we tend to get a great idea, we get super excited, and then we just jump into implementation. Don't do something like that. A prototype is a probe. And a probe is something you use to learn from. You take the probe and you get feedback from the probe and it tells you those things you did not know. So I want to start with Paul McCready and his McCready maxim. And if you don't know who Paul McCready is, he, he's a pretty amazing person. But he had this insight. He said, the problem is, is we don't really understand the problem. And what he meant by that is he was trying to solve human powered flight. And he thought, that's the problem I'm trying to solve. What he realized is that what he really needed to do was fast fail. Okay. So he's the one who came up with the Gossamer Condor, which is the first human powered flight vehicle. So what he realized is he wasn't really needing to figure out how to fly. He was needing to figure out how do I prototype and iterate faster? And so what he ended up doing is saying, I need to build this out of materials that I can fix in the field so that I can get more failures and learn faster through my prototype. And that became a huge insight. So by the time that the uh, contest came, which of course he won, he had already successfully flown. What ended up happening with the others is that they planned all the way to the point where they'd only tested once or twice and like their second or third test was the actual competition and then they were literally crashing at the competition. Now, this gets to the distinction between planning and probing. This is why prototyping is so, is so important because as the longer you take in planning, the more time and money it's going to cost you. We all have a runway. So probing helps us to get there faster by learning and fast failing. And so that's why the prototype uh, phase is so important. And then, of course, we have to test the prototype. And this is where I, I, I love to bring up Steve Blank, who is really considered the godfather of Silicon Valley. And um, he has this great quote. He says, no facts exist inside of a building, only opinions. So you've got to get outside. And of course, this is a theme in innovation. Get outside and go talk to the people you're trying to help. Uh, so Steve Blank uh, really popularized the concept of the minimum viable product. He didn't create the idea, but he really uh, popularized it. And he gives this great example. Um, he was working with some students at Stanford University who had come up with this really great idea, um, which was at the time uh, how to use drone, uh, drones and camera technology uh, and data collection to help farmers figure out exactly which plants needed exactly how much water. And they said, but Steve, the only thing is, is we have to spend about $100,000 on this MVP. So would you invest? And Steve said, no, you don't need $100,000. You need about $10. And they're like, what? What are you talking about? And he says, you only need $10. What is the output of this uh, product? And they said, well, it's data that the farmers could utilize to increase efficiency and save water costs. He goes, okay. He goes, so I imagine this is like paper and data and charts. Yes. Okay. Well, let's just build some that this would produce for our farmer and show them what the output is. And that will be about 10 bucks. We'll just create all this, uh, these uh, prototypes of the reports, show them to the farmers and see if they would actually buy the product. So he has this concept called eyeball 100 customers in 10 weeks. And so this is really about this idea of this pro what, what's called a product market fit. And he has these questions. He says, does the customer see this as a problem, whatever my solution is? So 
in this example, go to the farmers and see. And in their case, they did. And farmers said, yeah, I would totally pay for this. Um, but does the customer see this as a problem they are willing to pay to solve? Okay. Now, payment to solve might be money. It also might be time. Okay. Time is one of the most, if not the most value uh, commodity. And does the customer see this as a problem that they would pay to solve, that they would pay me to solve? Okay. So yeah, maybe they would pay to solve, but maybe they wouldn't pay you to do it. And then can I actually solve the problem? And if the answer is no to any one of these questions, it's time to pivot your um, prototype. Okay. And so testing isn't just about, uh, you know, I've got my prototype, now I'm testing it, and it's either go, no, go. No, you're going to continue. It's still a prototype. You're still fixing this prototype as you get feedback. So I love this quote from Diego Rodriguez, who now is doing other things, but he was a chief product officer at Intuit, which makes TurboTax. He says, show me your place where it's safe to fail. This is really key. In innovation, you have to feel safe to fail because... The whole idea is you have no idea what the answer is. That's why you're innovating. If you already know the answer, again, then don't do innovation. You're just wasting your time. Just go to implementation. But when you don't know, the only way forward is to design your way forward and to fail and learn from your failure. So you don't really fail, you just learn. And this is, there's lots of examples of how the most innovative companies, this is actually from 2016, okay? So this is really, really old. But um, you can see here, this is like how many tests they're doing per month, okay? Um, and then, of course, you have to implement. And I love this quote from John Doerr, who's the chair of Planner Perkins. He says, ideas are e easy. Execution is everything. It's not an innovation if it doesn't get implemented. Now, I'm going to give you some bonus material, but that is design thinking in a nutshell. Now, what if I don't have a specific end user for whom I'm designing for well, that's where my favorite uh, design thinking theory comes in. That's jobs to be done. And let me give you an example of this. Uh, this is Jack in the Box tacos. Okay, so I grew up in the West Coast. There's lots of Jack in the Boxes. Maybe you've had Jack in the Box tacos. Um, they're marketed like this, but they actually look like that, which ends up becoming important. So why do they sell a half a billion tacos per year? And when I asked this question, People who have eaten them say, well, they're good, they're cheap. Uh, because they're smushed together, they're not messy. And I can get them any time of the day because Jack in the Box is 24-7 drive through and so on and so forth. And what we're describing here are jobs that they have. Now, what's interesting about this, there's no demographic for these tacos. It turns out all kinds of people eat tacos from Jack in the Box, okay? And that is where jobs theory is really, really powerful because you don't want to unintentionally exclude large groups of people. So jobs theory becomes important. And it was really discovered by this guy. It was popularized by Clayton Christensen, but it was created by uh, Tony Olwick, who created the PC Junior, which was a complete and utter flop. And his question was, how do customers immediately know that the PC Junior was a flop? And if you remember this, if you're old enough, it had the clickety clack keyboard and all this stuff, and it was super expensive. And it says, it turns out that customers have a hidden set of metrics in their minds, okay? And that is the jobs to be done. And the goal of jobs to be done is to discover why consumers make the choices they do. And when I use consumers, I mean people who utilize whatever service or product that you are putting forward. So how do we discover the jobs to be done? Well, <laughs> Clayton Christensen comes in after you get Tony, who was one of his students, uh, shared this concept with him. He says, it turns out that people don't simply buy products or services, they hire them to make progress in specific circumstances. This is why I love jobs theory, because it's really about progress, not products. Perfect example is the Segway, created in 2001 as it's going to be the ultimate urban transport. It was launched in Manhattan, which is completely flat, but it was closed uh, and went out of business in 2020. Why? Well, because when you start thinking about the jobs to be done, you think, well, wait a second. Um, what happens when it rains? 
hey, this thing looks kind of dangerous. Do I need to wear a helmet? Am I going to have to wear a helmet on the way to work? Um, what if I need to jump into a subway? What do I do with this thing? What if it runs out of juice? Where do I plug it in? This thing is expensive. Um, you know, it just goes on and on. You start seeing it doesn't do the jobs. Then something like this comes along. Again, another innovation where you take something that exists, this software, right, that just aggregates people and customers that exists for many companies, and you apply it to this inventory of space and cars, namely idle cars that are just sitting there. And then you combine it with and give it to people who need to go from point A to point B. You get something like Uber. Helps you to make progress with almost no friction whatsoever. Compare this to like a rental car situation where I'm not sure if I'm going to get the car I want. I'm not sure how long it's going to take me to get my car. Then I got to figure out how to drive someplace. And so there's a lot going on there. But again, this solves the jobs to be done. And who are the demographics that use Uber? Turns out all demographics use Uber. So innovation is less about producing something new and more about enabling something new and important. Again, this goes back to that whole idea that we talked about earlier with Plato. So this is really uh, critical because Clayton Christensen said he taught at Harvard uh, Business School and he said, you know, one of the greatest sins we ever committed at Harvard is teaching people that the customer is at the center of the innovation universe. He goes, really, it's the customer's jobs to be done. And a perfect example of that is Steve Jobs, who, by the way, read Clayton Christensen's book, The Innovator's Dilemma, on his second uh, stint at Apple, which really took it off. But he said a lot of times people don't know what they want until you show it to them. There's that famous quote from uh, Henry Ford that basically said if you ask people about what kind of uh, transportation they, they wanted before the advent of the car, they'd say a faster horse. So here's a job to be done. A thousand songs in your pocket. This is Steve Jobs is a huge uh, music fan and he created the iPod. And it turns out that everybody had that job to be done, which is why the iPod was so huge. And then he created another product that was thousands of jobs uh, done. OK, so you get the idea is that you don't want to necessarily design something that excludes all these other people. And the way to do that is by focusing on the jobs, not the customer demographic. So a product that has been designed to specifically fulfill a well understood job to be done allows you to crawl into the skin, going back to Tim Brown earlier um, from IDEO and see the world through her eyes. It says to, your, to the customer, we get you. So the competitive advantage will be granted to whoever understands and best solves the jobs to be done. A perfect example of that is IKEA. A job is progress a person is trying to make in certain circumstance. And when you have this job to be done, help me furnish my apartment today. Guess who has designed their entire experience around solving that problem, right? You can go in there and look at the furniture yourself, see the pricing. Uh, go put it in your car, take it home, and, and put it together today. So what ends up happening is if you fulfill that job to be done really well, you become a purpose brand, okay? And that is where uh, people automatically associate your brand with the job to be done. Here's several example, examples. We talked about Uber and Ikea. Google, um, you know, just Google it. Uh, if I want search, uh, if I want to fast lunch at the, at the grocery store. I buy Lunchables. If I need to build my network because I need to change my job, I got LinkedIn. If I want my tax return today, I just uh, file my taxes, TurboTax, Family Friendly Entertainment, Disney, except for it's starting to lose its purpose brand. Google's starting to lose its purpose brand with AI coming on board. eHarmony, help me find my ideal match. Um, Amazon, I need this delivered tomorrow. So you get the basic idea. So to kind of hammer this home, uh, Clayton Christensen talks about the milkshake dilemma, okay? And it's uh, this, this came about when McDonald's hired him and his team to figure out how to sell more milkshakes. And why do people hire milkshakes? So he discovered when his team went and sat in the drive-thru of McDonald's and figured out who's buying milkshakes, they, they found out something interesting. They got an insight, and that was the majority of milkshakes were purchased before 9 o'clock in the morning. Who would have thought, right? And so they started asking people, why do you, are you buying this milkshake? And it turns out that they all had something in common. They were on long haul trips and wanted to consume high calories over a long period of time. 
And that's where the milkshake became important. It was clean, it fit into their um, cup holder, they could hold it with their hand, and the straw caused them to consume it slowly. So who had to get fired in that process? Uh, the Nutrigrain bar, trash, dirty, uh, the bagel, takes too much time, lots of dependencies like heating it up, cutting it, um, buttering it, or putting cream cheese on it. Banana, consumed super fast, then you got the banana peel to worry about. Burritos, they explode when you eat them, they're messy, and, and so on. So again, putting the jobs to be done at the center, it's about progress, not products. A way of defining this from an innovator's perspective, remember we shared uh, the other point of view, uh, is looking at the functional dimensions, seeing the role that the product or service plays in their life, what are the barriers or the points of friction, there's emotional dimensions, why is this important or is it important, when is the product important and when and why, and then social dimensions, who's involved in the purchase or the acquisition of, or the use of this product or service and what alternatives exist to it. So an easy way of kind of framing this is this uh, innovator's point of view that was really created by Alan Clement. Uh, so when I want to blank the situation, I want to blank the motivation and so I can blank the outcome. Let me give you an example. When I move my daughter into the dorm at college, I want her to feel settled so I can go home feeling confident that she is ready to embark on life outside the house. Okay, so that's a great example of why I would go to Ikea and go buy my furniture. So I'll throw this out to you uh, to kind of see if you can figure out how to apply this in a real life situation. So imagine trying to grow your market share in something like the cheese aisle, which is super crowded, right? And let's define, let's go to our users and find out what, what are the jobs to be done. And here, here's a statement. How can I enjoy all the delicious cheese experience I love on my daily sandwich without the calories, fat, and guilt that come with it? Now, I give this uh, challenge to students all the time. And they'll come up with some really crazy stuff. Uh, but think about this. Okay, so you might be thinking, well, let's do like something like Velveeta. We'll create a new cheese or some spray-on thing that makes it taste like cheese um, and things of, of that nature. What ended up happening is this. Sargento just took the cheese and sliced it thinner. And it turns out that you got half the calories and half the fat with all the flavor. And that created a whole new uh, category of cheese. It ended up, I think, uh, getting them $200 million in the first year. And now you see this all over the place. Competitors are trying to use it too. But the guy who uh, headed this up uh, had this to say about jobs theory. It really forces you to define the offering in the context of a very specific consumer struggle. And that is neither easy nor natural for most large organizations. And I would just really say any organization. So conclusion is if a customer or the person you're trying to serve doesn't see his or her uh, job in your product, it's already game over. Even worse, if the customer hires your product for reasons other than the intended job to be done, and boy, we know that can happen with our organizations, you risk alienating that customer forever. So here's some questions for you. What would it take for someone to hire your product or service? What are the jobs to be done? And who or what would they fire to hire you? All right. That marketing once for another day. I hope this was helpful for you. Feel free to uh, watch this over and over again. Reach out to me if you have any questions. Take care.